What's up, my podcast listeners? Um, this is going to be another compilation episode, in particular about kettlebells and how to train with kettlebells, the origin of kettlebells, and everything there is uh, that I know, and how I implement them to, you know, client programs and my own training, and how you can actually use um, kettlebells for um, specific rehab that I end up doing, um, with patients in the clinic all the time. And I think, um, you know, a couple days ago or even a, a week ago, I posted, um, a little video about kettlebell swings or kettlebell cleans. I can't remember which one it was, but, um, I was explaining in the copy that, um, uh, a lot of times so many trainers and so many you know, general population people use kettlebells because, you know, they see them at the gym, people see, you know, uh, people online swinging them and things like that, and they just do them so poorly. And I know I did um, a video, I think two weeks ago on breaking down the kettlebell swing, but I wanted to go into a little bit more depth when it comes to kettlebell training and kind of my thought process and the thought processes that I have found from other coaches that I look up to and kind of blend all that information to kind of give you, the listener, the viewer, um, kind of more information on why it's important to learn how to use kettlebells properly and not just, yeah, I see people swinging, so I'm gonna do the same thing, and now my lower back hurts for some reason and stupid shit like that. So um, I have two episodes where um, it's more so a... Uh, whiteboard session and it's a lot more like theory based so if any of you are big nerds of training that's going to be awesome um, and again I highly recommend if you are listening to this hit the show notes and watch this episode so then you have more of a visual cue but again with the whiteboard sessions I am going to be talking a lot in depth and a lot in, a lot in detail so you'll you'll be able to get it. But the very last episode that I've put into this one is the complete Turkish getup blueprint tutorial, whatever you want to call it. So for those who want to learn the Turkish getup and like, for me, the Turkish getup is one of those, like if I had to choose an exercise to do the rest of my life, that would be it because it challenges everything in your body. And to be able to, you know, get to a heavy weight and do it pretty successfully like that's like you're you're doing pretty good um so I highly recommend you at least watch that part because I think for a good 40 minutes it's all um hands-on coaching cues little things that you need to see in order to you know get the benefit from it but again I'm super descriptive when it comes to my podcasts um so that is it before I start rambling non-stop um quick update I am almost done in my book so I am hoping to release it for January I know I said it was going to be around this time but um I want everything to be perfect I want everything to flow seamlessly so January is probably going to be more of a realistic date um so without further ado here is the next compilation uh podcast video vlog thing about kettlebells here we go the way I want to get into this is one of the reasons why I use kettlebells a lot in my own training and with my clients. And I think it just comes down to how the kettlebell almost becomes, you know, part of you. So if you think about my little drawing here, with my little 32 kilo uh, kettlebell, um, the way it's designed is just an extension of you. So if I am holding it with my hand, and the bell is here, now my lever length is now longer, right? And I think this is why, one of the reasons why, there's, in my opinion, two reasons, why kettlebell training is so much more, um, I'd say, significant when it comes to um, a training effect is because the fact that it is extending your lever length, and we all know that in exercise, like, if I do a you know, push up off my knees, it's a lot easier than doing push ups off, you know, my feet. 
and that's because I cut the lever in half and I have now less, um, I wouldn't say resistance, but less um, to push off from, right? Um, so with the kettlebell, if you think of doing a swing in front of you, it's now elongating what your arms would be, right? And this is why dumbbells don't really work that well for swings. I mean, like, yeah, you can use them, but the way it's designed, it doesn't give you that same effect. And anytime you elongate the lever, it's going to make the exercise harder. So yeah, I could do a double handed dumbbell swing. Sure, I'll get, you know, my heart rate up, getting my glutes fired, core, whatever it is, but it's not going to make it that much harder. And, you know, I'll kind of hit a ceiling effect with that, even if I go heavier. Whereas with a kettlebell, you know, for the most part, if I was swinging a 24 kilo kettlebell, you know, the average person is going to find that challenging compared to a dumbbell that's, well, it's 24 kilos is close to 55 pounds, a 55 pound dumbbell, right? So that's the first thing is that elongates the um, lever. So in this case, if you're doing swings, your arms, right? Number two, it's a variable um, object. So when you look at the design of a kettlebell, the fact that the handle tends to be a lot smaller than the actual weighted part, right? It's like almost like an offset weight. So when you look at how a dumbbell is um, designed, a lot of times it is, you know, the weight, say if it's 30 pounds of a dumbbell, is evenly distributed within that shape of the dumbbell. Whereas a kettlebell, um, the weight is not distributed evenly, right? There's a little bit of weight in the handle to support the rest of the kettlebell so it doesn't fly off and break off. So when it comes to that kind of logic, it almost resembles what we do every single day. So like that grocery bag or your backpack that you pick up, it's not evenly, you know, um, weight, like the weight within that bag or grocery bag that you're holding, the weight is not evenly distributed. It's kind of all over the place. So you have to stabilize a little bit more, work a little bit more in order to, you know, lift it up or put it into your trunk, whatever it is. And I think the kettlebell is kind of the same way. It just requires you to stabilize a little bit more, which is going to bring me into my next point. And I'm going to periodically kind of go back and forth on my camera to make sure it doesn't shut off because sometimes it does that for, for some reason. So that being said, if kettlebells are required for you to stabilize more, it is going to require more muscle activation, meaning more muscle contractions, meaning more energy output, meaning more calories burned, meaning your weight loss, fat loss goals are going to come a little bit quicker. Um, you're going to be in a calorie deficit compared uh, a little bit easier compared to just using dumbbells. And not only from a fat loss perspective, but you know, from a cardiovascular per, um, perspective as well. Um, and the other thing that I look at is because you have to stabilize a lot more, we kind of go back to what I was saying before when we were talking about the joint by joint approach, joint centration. So when I think of stability, I think of safety. So if I'm holding a kettlebell and I know it's X amount of weight and I need to make sure everything's kind of like in a stable position. If I'm holding it, I want my shoulder to be in a joint centrated position. So it promotes from like a rehab standpoint, a lot of good things. And that's why I tend to use kettlebells a lot in a rehab setting. So the benefits are just like, like I can talk forever about it. But for the sake of this video and this podcast episode, we're going to try to keep it um, kind of a little bit shorter because I could talk about this stuff for about like two to three hours. So now that we know what the difference between a kettlebell and a dumbbell is when it comes to benefits, and I'm not bashing dumbbells like time and place, it's just if I'm looking for a certain goal to achieve, I'm definitely 
for the most part, I'm going to use kettlebells in some shape or form. And I'm going to get into those things of like what I use it for um, to get there a little bit faster. You know, um, kettlebells got introduced into the Western Hemisphere by a guy named Pavel probably around the 90s, but I didn't really kind of get steam rolling until the early 2000s. And, you know, the whole kind of training system came from um, the Russian army. And when you think about Russians at their prime of the Olympics, back I think in the 70s, they tend to tended to um, dominate the Olympics quite a bit based on this model of training that I honestly now can't remember, but um, essentially their work capacity was so high and one of the tools that they used were kettlebells, but they had this mindset that, you know, say you're cutting freaking wood outside and you're starting to get tired, your rest wouldn't be I'm going to just stop doing this for a while and then go back to it. It would be, let's find another physical activity that's different as my rest. So you go from chopping wood to digging a hole to putting the wood away, whatever it is. And kettlebell training is kind of the same thing. Is like, you know, it's not, this is a whole other conversation. It's how to program kettlebell training, but say as you fatigue doing swings you can put down the bell you can use either a lighter bell or the same bell um to do a different exercise that requires a little bit of variance so say i'm swinging i can put it down and now i'm going to go into squats you know going from a more hip dominant exercise to a more quad dominant exercise so i'm still working to build my capacity up but I'm just utilizing a different exercise. Um, And I think that's where kettlebells are so brilliant in that kind of aspect. Um, Where was I going with that? Where kettlebells started from? But I'm gonna kind of get into how I use them and why I use them as well, a little bit more into depth. So when I got first introduced to kettlebells and saw both Grey Cook and Pavel working together and then they demonstrated something called the Turkish getup. So for short, so I don't have to write it out, I'm gonna write down TGU for short. So the Turkish getup, I don't know why it's called the Turkish getup, but just the getup in general. When I saw this idea, this was one this was one of the reasons why I got into movement so much is that seeing an individual lying on their back, kind of going across body, almost into like a rolling pattern. And keep in mind, they're holding a pretty heavy weight. And then from there, going into a half kneel position and then standing, coming back down. And it just looked like this beautiful thing. And I was like, holy shit, like, what the hell is this? And like, that's where I kind of went into the rabbit hole of um, kettlebell training. And the Turkish get up in general, like it just mimics what um, kind of like those developmental stages as a child goes through. And this is where I think Gray decided to kind of dig deeper into the kettlebell world because the whole functional movement screen is based on the development, developmental stages of a child um, growing up. And, you know, when I started writing my first ironclad body book, you know, I went through one of the benefits, all the benefits of the Turkish getup and now rewriting and updating my book for the second volume, which by the way, I'm at like 64,000 words, crazy in depth. Um, I actually have the list in front of me here, um, for the getup because understanding all the benefits will one influence how you're going to train and I kind of look at the kettlebell world as kind of like missing links into your programming because like if you're a big meathead um, and like lifting heavy kettlebells is those like missing blocks in your training program that you need to add in order to do those big lifts so 
what I have written down here is literally 12 things. So the first one promotes cross-lateralization. And essentially what that means is in that position lying down. So I'm lying down, the right hand holding cowbell, left hand out to the side, and I cross my midline. It's essentially getting my like right brain to work alongside with my left brain. So there's a lot of like neurodevelopmental patterns of just lying on your back and learning how to roll over, which is what kids do when they learn how to develop. That rolling pattern is teaching your body that cross reciprocal patterning in order for you to eventually walk. And when I teach the get up, the biggest thing that I see is um, people not able to roll over. Like it almost becomes so surprising to me that, you know, people are like, oh yeah, I want to go to the gym and I want to lift heavy. I want to do the bench press. And then I get them on the ground. I'm like, all right, we're going to learn how to do the first phase of the get up. And, you know, they get into the position and then like their leg pops up. They can't roll over. They're like, what the hell is going on? And honestly, it's like, if you can't roll over, then there's a lot of missing links when it comes to your training. And I've had like strong dudes, and I put this in air quotes, um, try the get up just like the first phase. And the first phase, um, let's do this. Phase one. So, if you can read that. Phase one, there's two kind of ways to it. You can either end on the elbow or you can end on to the hand. So imagine yourself lying on your back, right hand up in the air, right leg bent, left leg straight out, hand straight out. The moment I take that deep breath in and come across the body onto the elbow, keeping my chest up, that could be considered phase one. Some people in the kettlebell world community will consider going up towards a hand as phase one. So really it's up to your discretion of where you want to go. But that's a, initially one of the hardest things for people to learn. So when I see people not able to do that, it's like, holy crap, you need to work on a lot of core stability and a lot of sequencing when it comes to movement. And Literally, when I get people good at this, it just clears up so much stuff. And also, like, just becoming athletic, just being able to function and move like a human being. Um, yeah, so moving on, it also promotes upper body stability and lower body stability. So when you think about those two, what I just said, both upper and lower body stability, what that means is that if I am coming into phase one, the fact that I'm holding a weight, and actually, you know what? In phase one, I actually get people to just hold a fist like and have no weight, and people still have trouble with that. And I'm like, to be considered strong, and this is one of the things with the Turkish getup, for men, they should be able to do the getup with a 24 kilo. The only time it goes down to the 20 kilo is if I think you need to be under 140 pounds. So if you're under 140 pounds, you're doing the 20 kilo. I only know this because when I was training for my RKC, which is the, um, I guess I would call it the level two. So they have the HKC where they just test, I think it's just a, a one day or a two day, I can't even remember now, um, where they just test your goblet squat, your get up and your swing with the 24. And I remember when I was doing my RKC, I had to use the 24 and I'm like, okay, what's the weight class? And I was around like 155 and I'm like, should I lose like 15 pounds just to do this? But I didn't go down that path, but women, to use the 16 kilo and same thing there's also a weight um class that's under and i think i think it's like if you're 120 or under that's when you get to use the 12 kilo 
So imagine this. These are the strength standards in the kettlebell world, both in the Dragon Door community and Strong First. And I have some people that literally can't roll over in phase one without any weight. So I'm like, imagine if I could get this person, a dude with a 24 kilo rolling over onto the elbow into the hand, like it's nobody's business. Like that is some powerful stuff. Now, because I'm holding that kettlebell, the entire get up and like we haven't gone through the other phases um holding that kettlebell the entire get up needs some sort of upper body stability the moment you get into the half kneeling position and that's where i would consider that um phase two that's where you need that lower body stability right this one exercise allows you to work both upper and lower stability. So when it comes from like a rehab pers uh, pers uh, perspective, can't talk, um, that is super important. So if I know I have limited time with a patient or person, client, whatever it is, and the one thing I can teach them, because a lot of times people don't know how to activate their core. They don't know how to breathe. They don't know how to relax, contract, things like that. So phase one, in order to cross the body effectively, you need to know how to utilize your diaphragm. So it's like, as I'm teaching someone how to breathe, I'm also gonna teach them how to do the Turkish getup. Huge dividends down the road. Now that patient, client, whatever it is, is really, really good at that. And now I'm giving them a kettlebell to practice with it, now I'm working shoulder stability. A lot of people have shitty shoulders and one of the issues is that it needs stability in order to do that. So it's like, awesome, now I'm building stability at the same time. Also at the same time, even in phase one, we're creating some sort of component of strength because eventually, and like, there's so many avenues to that I can go with this because sometimes I'll never go past phase two, just because sometimes people have shoulder mobility issues, which we'll also get into later on, but strength component. Sometimes I'll just get my male clients that are big dudes that don't have really good shoulders and just do phase one with a really, really heavy weight. Now, another thing, again, going back to my first point from the very beginning of me talking, yes, you could use a dumbbell, but the nature of how the kettlebell is designed, I find that because when you're holding it, you have the big ball here, that's a lot more challenging to stabilize than just a dumbbell here. And I've had people all, all the time is when I work with them in the clinic and I present a kettlebell for the first time and they're like, holy crap, like this is so different from what I'm used to in the gym. And they always ask, can I use a dumbbell for this? And I'm like, you can, but it's not gonna be the same. And then the moment they do try out their exercises that I give them, and we can probably get into it today too, is they realize that it's not as good and they end up buying kettlebells just because of that one time in the clinic working with me. Like that's how powerful these things are is that when you present it to a brand new person for the first time or just a meathead that hasn't utilized a kettlebell at all because they're just used to the barbell, whatever it is, dumbbells, they feel the difference. They feel the benefit of it, right? So the other one, we're on now number four, it promotes reflexive stability of the trunk and extremities. So this whole reflexive point going back to the cross body you know get up portion in phase one in order to do that the reflex of creating stability because a lot of times when people lie down and i tell them now i need you to roll over like the left like if i'm doing my right side the left leg will pop up constantly and what that tells me is they don't know how to create tension and enough intra-abdominal pressure to stabilize their body into the ground as hard as possible 
to come across the body. They don't have that um, reflexive um, stability work, right? Like, you know, it, it should be almost like a domino effect. Like you push that first domino and then everything falls into place. And I haven't found really another exercise like the getup to develop this kind of training effect um, as well as anything else out there. So I think that right there, number four, that reflex of stability is a game changer for people. And yeah, I haven't come across anything that, you know, can even match it. Um, number five, ties the right arm to the left leg and the left arm to the right leg. So again, it goes back to the reciprocal opposite arm, opposite leg. So if you look at us walking, you will notice that if you take your left leg forward into a step, your right arm counterbalances it. We walk every single day in that pattern, opposite arm, opposite leg, opposite arm, opposite leg. It happens naturally. So in my mind, I'm like, if that's a pattern that the human body, us as homo sapiens, that is ingrained in our brain as the most efficient way to walk, to run, sprint, whatever it is, it almost makes more sense to, you know, when you're in the gym, to resemble that movement, right? Lunges is one of those ways, but most of the time, like, our arms are fixed at um, holding dumbbells, whatever it is. And the nice thing with um, the get up, you get that cross patterning um, effect when you do the exercise. And again, it's another like moment where when I was researching the get up and I read that point, I was like, holy shit. It was like one of those times where like things started linking. I'm like, this makes so much sense, right? Like this exercise makes you better at being a human being right? Like it promotes what's ingrained in us since like the dawn of time. Like that's pretty fucking important and not let's place a barbell onto my hands and come down, I don't know, 20 inches just have my chest and then press it off. Like that's not going to give me, you know, my most bang for my buck for human performance. Um, Number six is gets the upper extremities working reciprocally with the legs too. So basically number six that I wrote here, from one to five, it gets down to number six, right? So it's kind of like a puzzle piece. Like the moment you start like peeling the onion, you start seeing all the other layers that kind of come together. Um, number seven, this is a huge one. It stimulates the vestibular system which is one of the three senses that contribute to balance. So when you think of balance training, people automatically assume that you need to be on a fucking BOSU ball with like your eyes closed, like you're about to do a fucking kick from the Karate Kid. That is not balance training. <laughs> Our balance develops as we are, you know, babies and we eventually walk. Like, it almost sounds, you know, crazy to think that as we are babies lying on our backs, the moment we start learning how to roll over is the moment that we start building our balance. If you look at the science behind how we develop, like, think about it. If a baby goes from, um, lying on their back, rolling over, crawling, eventually going into a kneeling position, standing up and walking, like that moment that they decide to walk, they need to have developed some sort of like balanced thing inside their body. It's not like, you know, they started doing exercises on a fucking BOSU ball to improve their balance. They develop those receptors in their feet, their whole body in order to be able to walk for the first time, right? It's really fast pace. And a lot of times when I get clients they are like, Oh, I have terrible balance. Oh, I have terrible, terrible balance. And I think of like, they need foot stability, hip stability, core stability. 
all those three things equate to balance training. So when I tell people, hey, we're going to do the Turkish getup to improve your balance, people look at me like, that's fucking crazy. But it all connects together. So if I wanted to improve someone's balance, I'm going to the Turkish getup. Um, this is another interesting one too when I was thinking about this is like it also stimulates the visual system so when you go through the entire um, Turkish getup and you know what let's go into phase two because we're gonna now start seeing these things this is going to go to point seven and eight. So we have our vestibular and our visual system. Um, so these two tend to happen right okay I will say it will happen in phase one but I think it kind of happens right in between phase one and two and then getting into the final get up which would be phase three so when I coach the kettlebell Turkish get up as you're lying down and you're holding the kettlebell into your fist. Your eyes are on the object the entire time. So now we're looking at our object. The moment we come across the body, we are still looking at that object. We are still training our visual system. Now, when I go into the high bridge position to transition into phase two, I am still looking at that kettlebell, still training my vision. Now, going into phase three is where all this stuff gets challenged. When I get into the phase two position where my hands on the ground, my knees on the ground, my legs out to the side, and I'm holding, as I come up and now I need to straighten out my legs into a half kneel position, my eyes will go straight that moment of looking up at the kettlebell and then looking out straight is where a lot of people will tend to lose their balance. But if I spend a lot of time in phase one and phase two, that's not gonna happen. A lot of people will have enough stability and enough training within the vestibular and visual kind of aspects of the exercise that when they get to the phase three where they're kneeling and they're gonna go into the standing position, balance is not going to be an issue and that's the thing like just think about when babies develop when they um how long it takes in each stage um in each stage they spend enough time to develop all those like kind of necessary steps to get to the next you know phase of their developmental stage so if i spend enough time with these two and i'm going place so let's go boom boom I tend to spend about eight weeks here and now I'm starting to think that I should start going down the rabbit hole of looking at the developmental stages of time for kids when they roll over and things like that but anyway that's gonna be another rabbit hole if I spend about eight weeks here in phase one and two by the time they get to phase three which is the complete TGU. All of these two, the vestibular and visual, and also like the stability necessary to get into that, tends to um, be pretty solid. And again, this, this number can change, but for the most part, I spend about eight weeks here. And now, the other thing I want to bring up is number nine on my list here. It also stimulates your appropriate reception system, which also contributes to balance. So I'm going to throw in another. Uh, how do I want to do this? This 
make a little bit of room here. Visual and proprioception. I'm just gonna put down prop. Hopefully you guys can see all of this. Um, the other thing that I have not set yet. The big thing with kettlebell training, which is so brilliant, is training in bare feet. When you see someone training in kettlebells with shoes on, you know that they don't know anything. <laughs> or if they're at a gym where they don't allow people to go barefoot, they're in like socks, that person knows what they're fucking doing. So if you look at children, most of the time they're barefoot. Most of the time, their feet are receiving all that information to develop balance, to develop, you know, if objects are uneven so it's not a flat floor. Like, our feet are like our hands. Our hands are constantly touching things and reacting and adapting to it. But most of the time for us, like right now, my feet are in socks and shoes when I'm at work, whatever it is, and I don't get that. So my feet tend to go to atrophy. When kids are barefoot a lot more, they learn how to create better balance. It's another reason why yogis have really good balance because they train in that element barefoot. If you saw a yogi with shoes on, they're not gonna develop the greatest of balance. And that's another reason why I love kettlebell training is that let's get back rooted into the ground and it transfers over to so many different things. So when I get someone barefoot, one, we're gonna be working on their balance indirectly just because they're barefoot. They're gonna learn how to stabilize on one leg. They're gonna learn how to grip into the floor. Now with those things, when it comes to lunges, deadlifting, squats, now they know how to get into the ground with their feet and not just like, oh, I'm deadlifting, I'm just gonna shift my weight back into my heels because that's how I feel my hamstrings. But then they are not, they're just losing so much that they could potentially have. So that's another huge thing that the whole kettlebell community provides us is that kind of, you know, return to where our roots are, um, which is barefoot. Um, where am I gonna go with that? Let's go to number 10, promote spatial awareness. So in order to get to phase three, like all these three things right here, all these phases, in order to do all those things, you develop like a kinesthetic awareness, like just knowing space and time. We almost learn your own consciousness of doing the exercise, right? A lot of times with the people I work with, they don't really have good coordination. Like if you wanted to improve your coordination, like this is the exercise to utilize. And the moment that you start doing the get up over and over and over and over again, you will find that your movement patterns just improve. Like there's moments where you're constantly looking at that kettlebell in your fist and your eyes will have to move to the transition, especially when you're up here and then you come up through to the kneeling position, you just need to know that it's there. Right, and that a lot of times people tend to look up, they tend to look at the object, right? But knowing that it's there, you develop a little bit more awareness around your body just because of this one exercise. Um, develops a front and back weight shift. So, this, in my opinion, is that moment where you're in a half kneeling position with the kettlebell up in the air and you need to shift your weight from that half kneel position to go forward. And this is like that brilliant, like honestly the whole exercise, honestly I thought I was gonna be just talking about kettlebells in general, I'm just going through the whole freaking, um, the whole get up, but um, the whole exercise is brilliant because now especially number 11, yeah, number 11 that we're on. When we move 
forward. Like when we want to produce motion or force or power, we need to know how to take the weight that's on us, within us, holding from a dead stop to a propulsion like position to go forward. And that get up will develop those small intricate muscles that are responsible for that movement forward, that weight shift from back to forward. On the way back down, like I look at uh, the kettlebell get up on the way up is almost learning how to accelerate your own body. Whereas on the way down, it teaches you how to decelerate. And when again, when it comes to athletic performance, those are the two things that every athlete needs is learning how to accelerate and decelerate, accelerate, decelerate. And if you want to get now sports specific, like you can have fun with learning the entire get up and doing tempos. Like you can tell people, I want you to go do your get up as fast as possible and as slow as possible on the way down. Or you can do the reverse without, you know, making it look crazy. But there's so many aspects where you learn in the get up how to accelerate, decelerate, accelerate, decelerate. And even when it comes to um, everyday people, like I think learning how to decelerate is very beneficial because when it comes to you recuperating from an injury or, you know, say you're crossing a street and a car comes in front of you really, really quick and you know how to decelerate and stop, it helps quite a bit. Um, the last one here develops upper body strength, trunk strength, and hip strength. So now that we kind of covered all the little nitty gritty stuff, the overlying um, benefit of the get up is the strength component. When I get someone able to do the entire get up from start to finish, um, then that's when I'll challenge the load. Imagine how I said earlier with someone not being able to just roll over, getting them to do that, and then adding for a dude a 24 kilo, for a woman a 16 kilo, and do that for you know one rep aside, like that is a huge achievement. Like if I had someone come in and they're like, I have a plateau in my deadlift. The Turkish getup is what I'm going to give them. And most of the time, even if people have done a Turkish getup because they saw it online, they don't do it right. They don't do it the way if you took a Strong First or a Dragon Door RKC certification. They don't know the hard style kettlebell way of doing the getup. Most people just kind of just roll into it and they're all kind of floppy. But doing getups with purpose is going to really, really, really help. So, I'm wondering how I am on time, because I can talk forever on this guy. Okay. I'm going to do a part two on this, because we're already at 40 minutes here. But, let's take this. We already know it has a huge influence on... Um, so many levels of human movement and performance but now and strength but now let's look at this from a rehab standpoint if people are injured people are weak like when i say a rehab standpoint people tend to for, think that rehab is literally i'm doing bird dogs and banded exercises like this that's not what that is I look at rehab training as just strength training with a purpose and utilizing specific exercises that people need. From a rehab standpoint, if I get someone doing the Turkish getup, it is going to fix everything. Let's go, for example, what I see in the clinic all the time. Low back pain. Will the Turkish getup help with low back pain? 100%. So let's make a whole another column here for rehab. So one thing that people need to 
help prevent low back pain is core stability. A core strong enough to fight flexion, extension, anti-rotation, and lateral um, flexion. The Turkish getup does that, right? If you can't keep a stable spine during the getup, you will just collapse. So if I get someone really good at the Turkish getup, low back pain tends to go away. What's another thing I see in the clinic? Terrible, terrible shoulder pain. What does a shoulder need? It needs, most of the time, stability. So if I have someone holding the kettlebell, and again, like most of the time, we're not gonna go overhead, so let's just stick in phase one here, where we go to the elbow or hand. How do I create stability? Let's get place a load, let's centrate the joint, and teach the shoulder that anytime you grip tight and hold a heavy weight, you're gonna stabilize. So I just created stability. We can have a subcategory here for the scap. What does the scap need? It needs stability. Again, we have that in phase one. And just in general, say I have someone that's an overhead athlete and their scap is all flimsy, loosey-goosey, Turkish getup in general, especially in that overhead position, learning how to stabilize it. What else do I see in the rehab setting? A lot of shitty hips, especially when hips need stability. When we get into the getup, especially in that half kneel position, I would bet that if I had a weight over my head in a half kneel position, and now I have to go from a dead stop from a split squat up into a lunge, that requires quite a bit of hip stability. That fixes my hip problem. Now, people with um, grip issues, that can lead to shoulder injuries as well. I'll just put down grip strength because that kind of leads into so many other things. So honestly, a lot of this stuff will, and you'll see more of these videos that I do, how my training kind of magnifies, and I've been using this word a lot, magnifies and spills into other facets of training. So I just went over just the Turkish getup, right? Of how it, what the benefits are, um, where, what benefit from strength, from a stability standpoint, and also from a rehab standpoint, where um, it fits. I think for the next upcoming videos, I'm going to do a part two to kettlebells, because there's so much more that we can talk about, and some other rehab stuff that I want to get into. But for the sake and time of this video, that's it for tonight. <laughs> Cause I can talk forever, but if you guys have any more questions, feel free to reach out. Is this concept of, oh man, this thing is moving. Tension. Other terms that fall in line with this is stability, irradiation, and let's go Core and engagement. This is super wobbly. I'm going to move it a little bit. This has so many pillows that are in the colors of Gryffindor. Just a side note. All right, so what the hell does all this mean? So words like tension, stability, irradiation, and core engagement. And yes, I did not write uh, the entire word because I realized as I started writing stability, it was a lot smaller than tension and I would probably end up at the edge and I don't wanna go all the way there. Anyway, when it comes to training, people tend to want to brace their core um, to prevent injury, to you know execute the exercise properly, but what does that really mean? How do we accomplish it? And 
do the words matter? Honestly, it doesn't. Like, if I have to tell somebody, like, imagine a fucking linebacker running at you and you try to, like, brace. That's another word we can even throw in here. Brace. Actually, another word. Intra. Abdominal. Pressure. So we got a lot of words that describe this idea of creating tension through our body while we're exercising. Now, how I teach this to clients who don't really understand it, because I find that, especially in a clinic setting, everyone's kind of just like loosey-goosey, flat, whatever it is, right? Um, how I create the feeling of tension, the feeling of creating core engagement, the feeling of stability, the feeling of irradiation is exercises that make you feel it no matter what you do. And I've been utilizing this technique, um, especially in my um, skin stretch classes, because, you know, an example is the dead bug. People know what that is. You're lying on your back, opposite arm, opposite leg, whatever it is. And a lot of people just kind of flop back and forth and are not getting the benefit of the exercise. They're kind of just like yanking on their hip flexors for dear life and then they feel it in their lower back. So if I can teach someone tension, it enhances the quality of the exercise and produces more muscle fiber um, activation, more muscle cells are moving and doing their thing. And that in turn will make you burn more calories. It'll get you sweaty, it'll make you feel like you did a good workout, it'll prevent injury, you're gonna be long, uh, you'll spend more time in the gym, you, that whole thing, right? How I teach this is something called the starfish game. So imagine if I was laying down on my back, and by the way, this is like a throwback to Cut the Shit Get Fit, the first ever t-shirt I made. This was probably made, yeah, three, Four years ago? Three years ago? Yeah, this is the first ever Cut the Shit Get Fit t-shirt. Not available anymore. Because remember, every time I come up with uh, t-shirts, it's like one of a kind. Kind of like Disney, where they have like new stuff. It's always new stuff every single year, and you can never get it again. Anyway, starfish. Boom. I'm here. Leg spread, arm spread to 45. I tell my client slash patient, don't let me move you. I'm going to try to lift your arms and legs off the ground and I want you to fight to stick to the ground. And like right away when I lift that first arm up, they're like, whoa! And then I go to the other arm and they know what to do. With the leg I go again and with the other leg I go again and we kind of just play around. And then they eventually like, oh shit, like that's what I'm supposed to feel. That kind of tension. And you can go try it right now if you have like a friend, your partner, or whatever it is to see what I mean. That feeling of tension is what people need in order to perform an exercise correctly, right? So when I think about this stuff, this is gonna get super messy. I'm gonna try to draw a giant circle. When I think about all this stuff, what this means is safety. Damn, that's terrible writing. Um, safety, right? So. If I were to go tell you to pick up a hundred pound dumbbell, you're going to like, oh shit, it's heavy. I need to like make sure I brace and pick it up so I don't fuck my back up. That's tension, that's core engagement, that's bracing, that's intra-abdominal pressure, that's stability, that's irradiation. That gives you safety, right? So if I can teach this from the very beginning with a new client, new patient, whatever it is, they are going to be set up for success. If you skip this step in exercise, that's where injury comes to play. Because what happens is when you don't train your body to adapt to stability work, tension work, irradiation work, whatever it is, then you have a problem. You end up fatiguing in exercise like everyone does. And usually in those kind of class settings, high intensity kind of bullshit, um, you end up losing the capability to keep that safety around your joints and then things start to pile up and hurt. So that being said, 
if we can create tension, we can create safety, right? So where does this fall in line with kettlebells? There's a few things. So if you've been following me on Instagram and Facebook, I've done a series of posts of like three things you need to know um, to get yourself out of pain. And one of them was tension. Learn how to create tension. So one of the first things I do after kind of grasping the concept of creating tension for a client or, you know, whatever it is, um, is the utilization of kettlebells. The first thing that I tend to do is teach a client, um, depending on where they're coming from, but usually it's like a low back pain case. So I teach them how to hinge and depending again where they are there's a few directions with this but typically i will go down the route of a kettlebell deadlift that's elevated um again i'm going to be doing another post um in the future about deadlift depth but for the sake of this video we're going to be doing an elevated kettlebell deadlift how heavy should you go it depends so there's kind of two trains of thought one you want to pick a moderate weight that's not too light or too heavy because if it's too light, the person doesn't really get it. If it's too heavy, they might injure themselves because they're coming back from a back injury or whatever it is. And you kind of want to fall within the middle. The other train of thought is you want to go heavy because that gives you some external stimulus of like, oh shit, I need to pick up something heavy. I better brace for it, right? So it really is up to the discretion of the coach, you, whatever you want to do. I tend to go on the safer side, but again, depending on the situation, um, for example, like CrossFitter, dude that is like rock solid, comes in with a back injury, and I want to reinforce the hip hinge pattern to kind of give a sense of stability, safety within his hips and low back. I'm not going to give him a 12 kilo kettlebell. I'm probably going to give him a 24, right? If the guy is used to fucking like deadlifting 400 pounds and snatching 135 over his head, those 12 kilos is not going to do him justice. And it's not going to get the point across that we're trying to make here. So, um, kind of depending on the situation, but with that kettlebell, the way I teach tension after the whole starfish game that we played I will get someone set up for a deadlift. I need to do another video on this because the deadlift tutorial I have online is old and there's so many more things. People that I've seen in the clinic and seen in the gym, anytime they come see me, I ask them this one question, what is your bracing strategy for your deadlift? And they don't know what I'm talking about and they have no idea like I spoke a different language to them and they kind of just stare at me like and I'm like okay we got some work to do and then first I ask them show me how you deadlift and usually just by going to grab the barbell and setting up I'm like this is the reason why you have issues but there's a lot of different factors in there so let's get back to the kettlebell so we're set up in the deadlift position, kettlebell is elevated, say we're using a 12 kilo. I will instruct the patient or client to grab the kettlebell and think about breaking the fuck out of that handle. And I get aggressive when I say this so they understand. I don't go, okay, when you grab a kettlebell, I want you to grab tight and just grip it really hard. Now I'm like, I want you to grab the kettlebell like your life depended on it and I want you to fucking break it. And I swear, honestly, I swear in patient visits and client visits and some people, like some practitioners will say that like that's unprofessional, but it, it comes across in not a negative way, if you understand, because the moment I say fuck in a professional setting, people clue into that really quick and they're like, oh shit, I got to pay attention because you just said the F word, right? So I use it to my advantage. I don't go like, oh yeah, I'll fucking pick up the kettlebell because fucking yeah, fuck, fuck, fuck. I don't do that. I use it sparringly and at the right moment to give it context, right? So now that I have the person's attention and they are gripping that kettlebell as tight as possible, I then tell them, I want you to take a huge deep belly breath. And again, 
going back to kettlebells and the Turkish get up part one, we already talked about uh, breathing and diaphragmic um, crap. All right, so they already know that stuff. So now they know I'm gripping as tight as possible. I'm taking a deep breath in. And then I tell them, I want you to push your feet into the ground as hard as possible and then push your feet out to the side as hard as possible and then drive that thing up as hard as possible. And the moment they do that, they come up and back down, come up and back down. And I go, okay, how did that feel? They're like, damn, that was hard. I'm like, yeah, we used 12 kilo kettlebell and we just used a better tension, stability, irradiation, core engagement, brace, and intra-abdominal pressure strategy that you've never used before in a um, exercise that you've done many times, but probably with really, really shitty form and didn't properly execute it. And your nervous system, your entire body was like, holy shit, what did you just do to me? That kind of tension will create more of a training adaptation and build a resilient ironclad body. Look at that selfish plug for my new book. Um, that's how I utilize a kettlebell deadlift to create tension, this concept of tension. That is literally one of the first things I do with every single patient, every single client to set them up for success. So now, you know, if we go back to part one, I talked about breathing. That's kind of here. Part two, we're going into tension, how to create it, how to create that safety net. So you got breathing, tension, safety net. And now we're adding the kettlebell. See how there's like levels to this? And this is how people need to progress in order to keep going to the gym, keep seeing results. And I, I think this is why a lot of people who end up, hey, it's January 1st, I'm gonna start going back to the gym, and they do the same shit over and over and over again, but these small little intricate things help a lot. Think about it. Olympic weightlifters and powerlifters, they usually have three lifts that they practice all year round, but somehow they get stronger, they get bigger, faster, whatever it is, right? It's just how you implement it, what kind of principles of training you apply to it, and that goes a long way. Now, how do I also create tension with other exercises with kettlebells? The one thing that I really, really like about kettlebells is that the handle is tends to be thicker than a dumbbell. And usually the kettlebells um, that I use that are good quality have this, and it usually also happens on kettlebells that are um, the testing ones. So for women, like I wrote this before on part one, um, depending on where your weight class is, you're either using a 12 or a 16 kilo, and those handles tend to be thicker. For men, it's usually a 20 kilo or 24. Um, and then sometimes, um, if you're a bigger dude, the 32 kilo, or actually no, to 28, I believe. I can't remember anymore. Those handles are thicker, right? So now imagine if I have to hold something thicker to make sure it doesn't fall to the ground and smash my feet, I need to grip tight. So this whole idea of creating tension, stability, irradiation, core engagement, bracing, and intra-abdominal pressure one way to do it is the grip. So just like the kettlebell deadlift, I am squeezing and breaking it apart. What that happens is sensing, sensing, can't even speak, sends a signal from all the information coming from my hand, going up to the shoulder and going, hey, we are gripping something fucking tight. Make sure you centrate, boom, so that we can lift this thing. And centration can also be in this category as well. How do I do that with a kettlebell other than the deadlift? Carries. If I gave two 24 kilo kettlebells and that's 55 pounds or close to 55 pounds in each hand to a client, the last thing they would wanna do is kinda fall and be loose they're automatically going to go boom i need to brace right that's another exercise that makes you feel tension stability radiation core engagement bracing intra-abdominal pressure and joint centration all in one exercise how do i take it a step further so i like farmer carries traditionally awesome exercise but the thing that I saw that happens in gyms all the time, especially in big box gyms, you have that one idiot that like starts running back and forth 
in the gym with heavy ass dumbbells and then ends up just like dropping them in the corner and going, ah, fuck. Um, so I can't remember where I stole this from. It's probably great cook. Like, let's be honest, this guy comes up with everything, but this whole idea of like, if you were walking on a tightrope. So if you are familiar with the FMS, um, the board is basically like a two by four. And imagine in that inline lunge position, um, you are basically in line with like, say if your right foot in front and your left foot is directly in line together. And that challenges ankle stability, knee stability, hip stability, and core stability to be able to hold that position. And what happens is when balance is present, your body slows down to contract and control the movement. So with that line of thought, I was like, if I combine balance requirements out of an exercise like a farmer carry, I'm gonna get a lot more tension, stability, irradiation, core engagement, bracing, intra-abdominal pressure, and joint centration. So now what I do, farmer carry to kettlebells, walking heel to toe while the other foot goes right in front. So I don't know if you saw my feet, but imagine this is my right foot, I took a step. My left foot comes right in front of it where my heel is basically touching my toe, and then I alternate walking forward. And then, depending on the person again, walking backwards in the same fashion. I typically do 10 steps forward, 10 steps back, twice. In that time, because you have to go slow, when people go fast on this, they end up losing their balance and falling. They, it, it's instant feedback, right? That instant feedback slows everything down. And when you slow an exercise down, you get more bang for your buck. No one likes fast exercises unless it is designed to be fast. Something like a farmer carry, when I slow it down, even though like say in a traditional farmer carry program, you have a hundred yards of a carry, you know, or a gym length and say that takes I don't know, 30 seconds, you walking forward and back twice, 10 steps, nice and slow, is probably gonna be a ballpark around 30 to 45 seconds. So you're still getting that endurance-like um, training effect in your grip, right? So now we've combined two things, two principles together to create a better training effect. And honestly, this is, this is what I think functional training is. Functional training is not oh, I do everything single arm and single leg, I balance and I go on a BOSU. No, that's not functional training. I think what functional training is, in my opinion, is taking exercises that make sense for the individual and trying to combine principles of different facets of the fitness industry together to make a better training effect, more bang for your buck. Like, we can only trash our body so much, so why not find other um, principles and strategies from exercise from, again, different places in the world that do really, really well. So, you know, balance and freaking grip strength, like put together, like that's brilliant, brilliant, right? So now another way with kettlebells to create this idea, so, I should have wrote that down. So I'm gonna go, I don't know why I changed colors, but uh, kettlebell deadlift, and on this side carries, I don't know why I wanna do this. Okay, something else that I wanna put in here. Another way to create tension with kettlebells. One, the Turkish getup. We're just gonna do one of these, TGU. And we already went over that. The other one, kettlebell, arm bar. Can't remember if I spoke about this before, but the kettlebell arm bar, arm bar, <laughs> arm bar is hands down my favorite way to rehab a shoulder and also learn how to create tension, but at the same time learn how to relax. Because this whole idea of like, I'm gonna create tension, 
I'm super tense, I have stability, I'm bracing, I'm, my core's on, but you can't really move eloquently when you're constantly bracing, right? Like, you need to be able to contract, relax, contract, relax, which I spoke about, I think, in the last whiteboard session about crawling, if I can remember correctly. So the kettlebell arm bar, if you don't know what it is, one, search it up on my YouTube page. I have a bunch of videos on it. But this, to kind of give a visual, is like if I was laying down to set up for a Turkish getup, I have a kettlebell on my right arm. My left arm is straight above me like an overhead press. And now my left leg is also straight. I lift my right leg up and I roll over to my side. And I'm in a sideline position with the kettlebell here. My head is forward and not looking at the kettlebell. Now I don't know where it is in space and time. So my shoulder has to stabilize. How do I teach my shoulder to stabilize? Going back to carries, I death grip that uh, handle and now boom, tension, safety, irradiation in this position. What is my rest of my body doing? Since I'm in a sideline position, it's kind of hard to like, I'm gonna contract my whole body in this position. It almost creates like this, I have full tension here to fight this offset weight, the rest of my body has to relax. And that's where I go back to breathing, like I did in part one with this kettlebell stuff. And now I have an exercise that's now getting the utilization of diaphragmic breathing, grip strength, shoulder stability, learning how to create tension on a unstable joint like the glenohumeral joint, all in one exercise. Again, another way for functional training to actually be functional, right? We're taking two or three even, con yeah, three concepts all meshed into one exercise. And it's one of those things where you keep doing it and then you start seeing that, hey, this is actually really easy. And all you do is either you increase the weight or now let's take away the visual system and I close my eyes and try to balance it out, right? Um, that's another one that I like to use. Bottoms up. Learning how to stabilize a kettlebell in a bottoms up position is one of the most difficult ways to do so. I think the bottoms up position is probably the most underused exercise out there right now. Um, the kettlebell community does use it. I don't think they use it enough, um, to be honest with you. I remember when I was first introduced to the bottoms up position, so kettlebell bell thing is up here and then the handle goes through your hand. That requires a lot to stay in, in that one position, let alone throw in a carry variation, let alone do it in a Turkish getup, let alone do it in a kettlebell arm bar, let alone I'm gonna add another category here so I can talk about it. Squats and lunges, which is another way to create tension, but I'll talk about that later. Um, let alone do that with a squatting pattern or a lunge pattern. You can't really do a, a deadlift without bottoms up that I know of. Yeah, no, I don't think you can. Um, when you introduce balance, what happens? Tension's created, stability's formed, irradiation happens, core turns on, you're bracing, intra-abdominal pressure happens, and you centrate your joints. Because in a bottoms up position, it almost like tells your nervous system that something even heavier is there. And like, honestly, when I use like a bottoms up position for patients, it's like a six or eight kilo, and they're like, oh my God, right? And that almost tricks the nervous system into thinking it's heavier, so now everything has to get that tension to create that safety that we want. It is like a self-correcting way to place all of our joints in a better position, a more optimal position, right? So if we know that bottoms up is like a piece that layers on top of all these exercises, that's how you progress yourself, right? But there's elements of the bottoms up that can help. So. Say I have someone with a really shitty shoulder that needs to work on their stability work, just holding this without any movement, 
for 30 seconds and then switch sides and they're like, oh shit, this is really easy, right? Usually what I do to make sure that the other side's not just wasting time, because when you hold a kettlebell, I don't know if you guys can see this, um, a lot of people will try to balance it on the palm right here, right? And then what happens is when it becomes easier, you either go heavier or what I do is I slide the wrist into a neutral position where the knuckles point up. Because a lot of times when people hold the kettlebell, the knuckles are pointing towards a wall. But if I strain it out and now the literally the handle of the bar is at the bottom of my palm, that's a lot harder to hold and stabilize, right? So that's something nice and simple, right? From there, that's where I'll do some sort of carry variation. From there, you know, we can do something like a squat, right? So rather than holding a kettlebell here or, um, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but rather than holding a kettlebell here or a dumbbell here, bottoms up position, same pack position and squat. Like that's really challenging. But another thing I didn't talk about is just a regular um, goblet squat with a kettlebell. The way to create tension in it, when I'm holding the horns, so the handle part is called the horns, again, just like the kettlebell deadlift, I'm telling the person to death grip it, but also to pull it apart like you're Superman ripping off this shirt, right? This pulling apart piece gives you that lat engagement that you want, shoulders are centrated, and you're creating that tension. So I get people to do that. And they're like, holy shit, this is like the hardest squat I've ever done with a 16 kilo kettlebell, right? So all this idea of tension, you can do just like body weight stuff. But the reason why I like um, kettlebells to teach the tension is that it creates a global magnifying effect. It just enhances it. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of like Google earth when you're like looking at one little address and then you're like, Oh, what else is around there? And you click that little minus sign and it just broadens your perspective. And that's what kettlebells do. They broaden the perspective of each exercise. Oh, Oh, I kept going. I just got the, uh, low battery sign. I'm at 20%, so I might have to wrap this up. Um, so that being said, you want to find exercises that will magnify and broaden the effect of it. And kettlebells just do that. So think about every exercise that you're doing right now. There's probably some sort of variation out there with a kettlebell that will just give you that extra edge. Now, I'm not saying like, as of right now, start using kettlebells for every single exercise. It's like, no, like if you've been doing a single arm dumbbell bench press forever, try it with a kettlebell. It's going to fucking suck. It's going to encourage you to stabilize more, create more tension, burn more calories, do your thing, get stronger, burn more fat. Boom. Simple change. If you've been lunging with dumbbells, fucking throw kettlebells in there, right? There's so many different carry variations with a kettlebell that you can do with that feels more natural than a dumbbell that will enhance your lunges. Think about a double racked kettlebell, offset double kettlebell, um, <laughs> offset single kettlebell um, reverse lunge, for example, a fucking bottoms up reverse lunge. Like the possibilities are endless when it comes to this. It's just like your imagination of what you can do, right? So I'm going to leave it at that because I don't want my camera to die out but I think kettlebells is one of the best tools to create this concept of tension to build a resilient body to build that ironclad body coming soon um and overall just make you a badass in the gym like I look at kettlebells as kind of like filling the gaps of your training program and the more you can use them the better it is and they fucking look cool <laughs> Um, okay, I want to end it there. Turkish get up. As you recall, the get up itself kind of stems from a developmental standpoint, um, how a toddler develops. And it all starts with lying down in a supine position. So with the get up, you're starting on your back. So if you imagine yourself lying down, 
Super easy, right? Lying down, get to lie down. For the sake of this video, I am gonna go right leg straight out, left leg is bent, left arm out to the side, and right hand is gonna be up. And I always coach with the fist, because I want people to think about I'm holding a kettlebell. And this is actually the first point that I'm gonna get into. Um, I never start anyone with weight if they've never done the Turkish ghetto. To a point where I will, this is how I break it down. I will s go through the phases with you. And phase one is up to the hand, similar to the position I am in right now. Um, but I spent about four weeks there with people, practicing it every single week. Phase two is the like hip bridge, hip lift with the leg sweeping under. And then phase three is the entire get up from top to bottom. So I spend four weeks at each phase and essentially 12 weeks of time will go by before I give them a weight. And then what I'll do to challenge them, my, that being uh, my clients, is that by the time they get to phase three, they're doing the full get up and back down, my assessment to see if they're ready to hold a weight is they're gonna either put the shoe on their fist or a yoga block without you know using their thumb or anything like that to cheat. Um, this one will slow down the entire getup itself and showcase all the little weak spots. Because a lot of times when I teach the getup, people, you know, even if I tell them like slow down, slow down, slow down, they will still go fast no matter what. I would have to physically hit them in order for them to stop moving so fast. But the moment I put their shoe on their fist or you know, yoga block on their fist, everything slows down and they feel where they need to work on. The moment they can go all the way up through the get up and all the way back down with the shoe or the yoga block on their fist, that's when I will give them uh, a weight. So little side note. Now, we are lying down on our back. Right leg out to the side, left leg is bent, right arm out to the side, left hand up and towards the ceiling and in a fist. In this position, I always start with, all right people, your right leg is gonna be generically at a 45. Your hand, your right hand, again, is gonna be generically at a 45 degree angle. The left hand into the fist. Your eyes are always gonna be pointed at the fist at all times until I tell you to change it. I don't know why I paused for so long. But from this initial point, we're gonna take a deep diaphragmic breath in order to create enough, enough intra-abdominal pressure to stabilize this entire section for us to roll over. If you do not know how to utilize a diaphragmic breath, the Turkish getup is not gonna be your best choice of tools to train with, right? It all starts here. And I will tell you why in a second. So the first phase is gonna go onto the elbow and onto the hand. So deep breath in, I hold it, and as I exhale is when I roll to the elbow. So you can already see that my chest is in line with my two shoulders, with my hand up in the fist, and my other hand along the ground. From this position, I'm gonna come up towards my right hand, and again, my chest is up, and my left hand is in a fist. This entire motion that I just did, my eyes have not left my fist, all right? The moment your eyes start to wander in different directions other than your fist that's holding your pretend kettlebell, if you were to have weight and I was looking over to my right, I don't know where my left arm is in time and space, so most likely the kettlebell is gonna eventually like peer over this way or this way, I'm gonna lose joint centration of my shoulder and worst case scenario, the bell falls on me or I hurt my shoulder. Where people screw up in this first phase is as they come across to the elbow, they don't have this flat chest, neutral chest with both shoulders in line. They kind of fall into their right shoulder, the 
the right shoulder kind of falls into an anterior tilt. And now they have all this pressure in that front of the shoulder and it's a bad habit to kind of fall into. The more they fall into this, the more the chest is gonna cave and now that bell is gonna now kind of fall forward as well and it's just gonna fall apart. Now, another thing with the shoulder, the moment I come up towards the hand, the same thing usually will happen is that shoulder is gonna collapse forward. So I always tell people, think of getting a centrated joint or really simply chest up. The moment you go chest up, shoulder falls into play, a place. It's very similar to if I was doing a farmer carry, the last thing my body wants to do is round my shoulders forward because of the weight. It's not gonna feel that good but it's gonna naturally wanna go back if the weight's heavy enough. So in the get up, you don't really get that same um, sense of feeling. You have to find it with your shoulder. And a lot of times this bit can be super awkward. People are like, eh, I don't really know what I'm doing and they do this weird thing that I'm doing. So that being said, this arm, I always start people with a 45 degree angle, the right hand on the ground. And it all depends on the person's anatomy. So obviously I don't get to work with people that are like me where I have really good shoulders and we have to find kind of like a middle ground of where this arm, this right arm is gonna be placed. So say I have my client or person I'm working with go up to their elbow, it's all kind of all over the place, they can't find that position, they get onto the hand, it's even worse. Then I'm like, okay, let's restart and let's try having that right arm further out to like more of a 90 degree angle. And maybe that is where they're like, oh, that feels so much better. And now they can come up to the words the hand, right? Same goes, it's just finding that angle that works best for the person's shoulder because everyone's shoulder is built a little bit differently. And then if you're a person that sits at the desk all the time, it's gonna need some work, right? So it's always about finding the angle that works best for you and your client. So this right arm, totally up to you where you wanna put it. Now, the next thing, as I come up to the elbow, sometimes the issue is when they come up, no matter where they place that hand in the very beginning of the get up, it's still gonna feel awkward. So sometimes on that elbow, I'll tell people to either take that right hand and swivel it out and then come up, and then they're like, oh, that made it a lot easier. Or they can you know, swivel it in and then come up, and they're like, oh, that's a lot better. So now you have another option based on someone's anatomy. You can rotate the elbow into the different positions so then when you come up onto the hand, it's a different angle for the shoulder to be placed in. So you can already see there's so many different little variations in just this first phase, and I haven't moved on to other things that we can play around with. That being said, this also shows you what's going on with the person's shoulder. If I know that no matter what is going on with all these different variations for this hand, then I have a lot of work to do with this person to ensure that they you know, get better shoulder mobility. And sometimes it just comes in time. Like, you know, I create a program for somebody and I want them to utilize a Turkish getup and I know their shoulders are not the best, but in conjunction with the Turkish getup, maybe I have them doing a shit ton of shoulder cars, scapular cars, shoulder external rotation, pails and rails, that kind of stuff. And eventually it will come in time and that getup's gonna look a lot cleaner, right? So the next thing I wanna play, place an emphasis is this right leg. The biggest mistake or, you know, thing that I see with the getup is this leg popping up when someone's trying to come across, they do this thing, right? The moment they take that deep breath in, they exhale, they come to the elbow, the right leg pops up and then they're here. What that tells me is that they did not want, number one, did not do a proper diaphragmic breath to utilize that stiffness, that stability, that tension to come across. Somewhere there was an energy leak and now when this leg pops up, think about it, what, what is this motion? This is hip flexion. That means my hip flexors are pulling my torso up, right? And if you think about it, you're like 
psoas major, that big, big, big hip flexor, it connects right underneath that diaphragm. So that's why a lot of people end up looking like this to get up and it's a struggle. So what that means is that a person's core might not be strong enough. They still don't know how to breathe properly. So they need to kind of go back to the foundations of learning how to utilize a diaphragmic breath, some basic dead bug progressions, some basic bird dog progressions, things like that, and then come back here. A lot of times I'll see on Instagram or Facebook people that are not kettlebell instructors um, that think they are able to do kettlebell workouts and they do like heavy get-ups and super sloppy and their entire leg pops up every single time. They're just like muscling it through and then you wonder why people have low back pain trying to do swings and Turkish get-ups. So sometimes it's just about teaching a person how to create tension in the get-up because it is a dynamic movement but you can add parts of it with a more um, tension-based uh, approach. So, and I'm gonna move back to the arm in a second too about that. So in this position, when I see that right leg pop up, sometimes it's as simple as like telling, hey, when you roll across to the get up, I want you to drive your heel into the ground as hard as possible. So when they come across with that added tension of their heel, now they kind of created this chain of tension in order to come up. That being said, you can also do that with another body part. If you remember correctly, you have your right leg straight out, adding that tension. Your right arm is also into the ground. So I always coach the hand being pushed into the ground at the same time as the heel. So now they have more tension driving in. So you're using your hand and you're using your heel. But the other thing too is the elbow. As you're rolling to the elbow, I tell people, think of pulling your elbow back into the ground like you're trying to like rip the ground apart and that engages that lat and Terry's major to kind of pull you through like kind of doing like a like a lat pull down or pull up uh, motion you're actually pulling yourself up right it's not so much I'm rolling over I'm actually pulling myself up into that position right so now that we have all those um, tension-based um, approaches, the get-up becomes a little bit easier in that initial position. And in my opinion, the first phase is the hardest phase because you're going from like a non-supported position that requires now a lot of s mobility, stability, and strength all at the same time to get the whole process started. Because remember, a object in motion is a lot easier to move than an object that's not in motion, right? It's basic physics, I think. I can't remember, I did terrible in physics. But um, yeah, so also with the leg, similar to the arm, it all depends on the position. So sometimes you'll see people with really, really tight hips or hip stuff, sometimes that 45, is not gonna feel good, they'll pop up, it's gonna like fall apart and collapse. So you're gonna have to find different angles where the leg can go. Like there's nothing wrong with having the leg straight in order for you to do a get up, right? Like there's no rule against it. You can use whatever angle you need in order to get there. Um, sometimes what you'll get is when people are in this abduct position of their leg and they try to come across, they're like TFL and hip flexor can start cramping because they're just not used to this position. Um, another thing that I've seen is people with really tight hamstrings, they can't lock out their knee in this extended position. So having a slight bend in the knee, again, not a big deal to get through the getup. Like you gotta work with what you got. A lot of times people try to put that square peg in the round hole constantly and they're left with painful, painful patterns and they end up with fucking shit that they don't want. Um, that being said, sometimes if the shoulders are not there when it comes to the get up, I will sometimes leave the person there for another four weeks um, doing the get up. So here's an example. Most people with shoulder issues, they need shoulder stability. Sometimes I will use the Turkish getup, 
just phase one for like eight to 12 weeks for this one particular person that needs a lot of stability in their shoulders, but they don't have the mobility to go overhead because as we progress in the getup, we need a lot of more, like a lot more range of motion, right? And if someone's overhead looks like this, like I melt the candle, my elbows bend, there's no purpose of me doing the get up at that point, especially in a loaded position, right? I'm just feeding the fuel to the dumpster fire of a shoulder. Um, so sometimes I will like do the four weeks and I know that, hey, their shoulder flexion is not the greatest. I'm gonna stay another four weeks, but now I'm gonna add, you know, the yoga block, the shoe, whatever, to add that little bit of um, feedback to see if they can keep everything else in integrity as they uh, progress. And then maybe the next phase is where I give them a kettlebell. Or maybe in that phase after they do their first week with the yoga block, shoe, whatever, so easy, it's like, okay, let's load it now and get really strong at it. And then say like their shoulder mobility is still not the greatest and I can't get them into that overhead position, then I will give them the kettlebell in a bottoms up position to challenge the shoulder a little bit more, right? So this is where you can utilize the get up in so many different ways, right? Um, that being said, we are gonna go into phase two. I'm really hoping that I'm gonna get this under an hour because we're already at 20 minutes. So, from phase one, I wanna make sure I'm in the shot here. Left leg bent, right leg straight out, right arm straight out, left arm up towards the ceiling in a fist holding my pretend kettlebell. Deep breath in, exhale. I'm on my elbow, I come up to my hand. From here, I'm sliding my hand in close to my torso slash hip. The reason behind that is the next step is I'm gonna push my hips up towards the ceiling into the high bridge. And from here, my right leg goes underneath my entire body. This is phase two. The way I would come back is the same way I came in. Sweep that leg out, slide my hand to where it was, back onto the elbow, and then back down. All right, that's phase two. I'm gonna move the camera a little bit so you can see a little bit of a higher angle. Um, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen in this phase and a lot of stuff can go wrong. So, number one, the eyes. Remember when I said that earlier? People will come through, they're ready, and the moment they come up and now they have to bring this right leg underneath, they look down on their leg to make sure they're placing it. And it's like, hello, what's happening with my left arm with this imaginary kettlebell? If I had a kettlebell and I looked down where my leg is, this bell's going down to the ground. So at this point, I am still looking at my hand the entire time, all right? So with that being said, we're gonna come back to all that. We need to focus on this right arm. So, if you remember, deep breath in. Exhale hard to the elbow. Chest is up, shoulders are in line. I extend the arm. From here, if I did not slide this right hand close to my torso and hip, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna have not, I'm not gonna have enough hip extension to get my arm through. Right? The moment I slide this arm in closer to my torso and hip, boom, I can get my hips so much higher to have so much room for my right leg to sweep underneath. Right, So just like I said in phase one, the shoulder is going to do this weird thing. Right, It's not going to know where to go forward or back or what's neutral. So when you slide that arm in, you got to do the same thing of keeping that chest up shoulder in that centrated position in order to be able to lift yourself up. Because remember, what if I was holding a 24 kilo kettlebell and this shoulder wasn't in line the way it should be and I left it out here, now I'm not in a straight line. Like you can even see in the camera, like that does not look good, right? You wanna find a position where you can place that shoulder in a centrated position in relation with the hand and with the other hand towards the ceiling. That being said, again, everyone has different shoulders. So 
Sometimes you don't have to go as close to the hip as possible. You can go a little bit further away, right? Now, when you have enough hip extension, this leg just slides right underneath the leg, uh, the body so easily. But what you will see is people not having enough hip extension, they don't go high enough, and they almost like drag this leg underneath to try to get it underneath, right? So it can just be a coaching thing, or now it becomes your assessment and going, okay, I lack hip extension. I need to do exercises that will give me more hip extension, especially in my warm up. Maybe I pay attention to my TFL, hip flexors, my breathing in my soft tissue work before a workout to ensure that when I get to this point, I have enough hip extension to get my leg underneath. This is where a lot of people will um, screw up or have difficulty performing this movement. The other thing in that transition, there's a lot of stuff that can happen in that transition. So I'm about to lift my hip up and grab that leg underneath me. Sometimes when people come up, they don't really know where to place this right knee. Sometimes they cut it too short. Sometimes they go too far back. Sometimes they go too far back this way. They go too close this way and they're all bunched up. So the best way, just like any other exercise, if I were to not stack my joints upon each other, things fall apart. So in this case, I want to get my right knee in line with my right hip. Right? So now when I'm holding a kettlebell in my left arm, like I am solid, right? I'm not going anywhere. I'm gonna move this arm so it looks a little bit better. So now in this tripod position, essentially, I'm sturdy. Like I could have a hundred pounds here and I'm not going anywhere because I'm stable and stacked, right? Another weird thing that I've seen is with this right foot, if you can see behind me, people won't have it in line with the knee. They'll kind of do this thing or have it too close this way, like just have it right here, stacked and ready to go. All right, so now the other thing that I see in that transition that happens so much, again, it can be a hip extension thing, it could be an ankle mobility thing, it can just be a motor control thing. But a lot of times when people try to come up, this left heel for some reason will come up for them to get through. It could just be a, you know, conscious thing that, hey, my right heel is going to be coming through and I don't want to hit my leg, which will happen sometimes. People will come and like kick their own ankle to come through. And again, it'll be a hip mobility thing, neuromuscular thing, hip extension thing. And it can also be an adductor thing. So that's my next point. So you can already see there's a lot of stuff that's required to perform a really good looking Turkish getup, right? So this is why too, I spend so much time without awaiting it. Cause it's just similar to like, Hey, my, you know, squat mechanics look like shit. So yeah, let's load it with a fucking barbell on my back. No, it's fucking stupid. You want to, you know, be able to squat with your own body weight without looking like a melted candle then like going to the thought process of like, no, I'm fucking put a barbell on your back, 135, it's just gonna self-correct. Like, no, fuck that shit. You're gonna learn the way it's supposed to look like, body weight, and then add load to it. If you can't control it with your own body weight and your own arms and legs, like what are the odds of it looking any better with weight? Um, tangent, totally awesome. So I'm going back to my transition. As I'm bringing my right leg underneath, this left knee will sometimes just collapse in like this. A lot of times people have really tight adductors and they don't have enough hip external rotation to push this out. And in this position, like if you really think about it, you need adequate external rotation of this hip to showcase, you know, a solid foundation with a weight above your head at this point, right? Um, so sometimes like, I even do this as a warm up exercise. Like in this little tripod position, I will throw in some T spine mobility while coaching to push this knee out to get a little bit more external rotation, right? You can utilize all these different positions that the get up provides 
as a secondary exercise. A lot of times people will, you'll see online, will break up the get up like I am, but add a little twist to it, a little mobility to it, or whatever it is, to help promote all the muscles involved um, to stay a little bit more limber, more flexible, or whatever you wanna call it. Um, that being said, that second phase requires a lot, right? A lot. And again, just like phase one, I might extend it for another four weeks. You know, maybe this is where, kind of similar to phase one, I give them the shoe, the get them whatever, right? Because again, the shoulder doesn't need that much flexion um, ability in this position. So sometimes, you know, if I have that person with a shoulder issue, again, I spend another four weeks, their shoulder mobility improves, and now we're gonna go up to the next position. Before I move on, um, I'm gonna do the first kind of transition phase um, at this angle, and then I'm gonna go change the camera angle to make sure you can see everything. So, to summarize those first two um, phases. So I'm lying back on my back, right leg is out, right arm's out, left knee is bent. And another thing to say, if you were to use the wrong side, it's gonna feel super challenging to come across and it'll feel super awkward. That's how you know if you did it wrong. And clients do that all the time. They forget you know, left and right all the time. So keep that in mind. All right, we're back to the start. I am taking that deep breath in, exhaling hard onto the elbow. Chest is up, shoulders in line. I come up onto the hand, slide that hand, hand hind, <laughs> as close as possible to my torso, high bridge with those hips, sweep the leg underneath. I'm in this little tripod position, I'm sturdy. From here, how I'm gonna get to the top, I'm gonna shift my hips to my right heel. And this is super important. So now when I can come up, into my hips, I'm literally doing a hip hinge, AKA the deadlift with my hips. Whereas if I was here before and now trying to come up, I'm kind of like using my QL and my okay, obliques just to lift up this entire weight. Whereas I could use my hips to stabilize and you know, I have a lot more musculature through my hips to lift and use that motion than my entire torso coming up. So this is where I'm going to adjust the camera a bit. So I am done, and again, at home, I always use a yoga mat because the getup tends to be hazardous on knees. So if you have a really thin yoga mat like I have right now, because my wife took my good one, um, roll up the mat. So I'm in this half kneel position now. You have two options here. I prefer the second option. So in order to get up, I need to have both legs in line. So a lot of times people will take this right knee and swivel it in the back, so now I'm in a half kneel position with my left arm up. Or, what I like to do instead, because sometimes, like in this case, where the flooring is not the best for my knee, and the last thing I wanna do is add like sheer axial rotational force into it. Um, I can't remember the term that they use in strong first, but I call it closing the door. So in this half kneel position, I'm gonna take my left leg and sweep it in front of me, and now I close the door of my hip into a half kneel position, and now I can lunge forward up into the get up position. And again, I know I'm kind of out of frame, but you get the idea, I'm standing up straight. Now I can come back, and the way to come back is I'm going into a reverse lunge into my half kneel position. Now I gotta open up this leg. Now, same way it came up, I'm pushing my hips back into my heel into a hinge and my right hand is coming onto the ground. From here, I'm gonna shift my hips forward. And now, from there, I can slide my leg out to that seated position. And again, that right hand is gonna slide out, back to the elbow, and back down to the ground. Now, 
we did a shit ton of stuff there, like a lot. And there's a couple things we need to note when the eyes change. So if I'm starting back up, I'm on my back, I get to the elbow, I get to the hand, slide the hand in, I lift up those hips, I bring that leg underneath. I now shift my hips into that hip hinge and I'm still looking up, I'm still looking at my eyes. I now push my hips forward into that hinge and from this position, now I can look forward. Now this bell is above me and it's just like if I was doing a shoulder press, I'm not looking every single rep above my head because I know it's there. I'm stabilized, I'm good to go. It's kind of like the kettlebell arm bar like, I'm not looking at it. I'm resting my head forward because I know it's there. But, you know, it. I don't know where it is in space and time, but my shoulder has enough stability to keep it there. So, at this moment, when I get to this half kneel position, now my eyes can go forward because now I need to see where I'm going to go. So, if I'm going to choose the option of closing the door, I'm still looking forward, and now I'm coming up into that standing position. Now, coming down... We want to recreate everything we did in order to come uh, back down on the way up. So if I am in the started position, left arm up, this right leg comes back into that half kneel position by going into a reverse lunge. This leg will open up back again. And now my eyes look back up because now I'm going to push my hips back into that hip hinge my right hand is here, right? Like, this is the other thing too. A lot of people make a mistake. Wherever my right knee is pointing at this uh, spot is where my hand should go. A lot of people from here end up kind of just like falling over like this. And again, we're using that QL and uh, side oblique that's not as strong as your hips. So utilize your hips. These guys are strong. If you're deadlifting, lunging, whatever it is, like utilize your hips. So. What I like to do is like slide my hand down the crease of where my hip is down towards my knee. And that gives me a direction of where this right hand should go. So at this point I'm looking, I'm sliding my hand down to the ground and I shift my weight forward into the shoulder. Now I'm still stable. And from here I can lift that leg through and I'm still looking at my hand, slide that hand out, elbow, I'm still looking at my hand and back down. So that is the entire getup. Now, the other thing we need to mention is when you do get to the point of, you know, of weight, there is a proper way of picking up a kettlebell. And this is probably the biggest pet peeve that I hate that I see that people do. So I'm gonna grab my 12 kilo here. And it's on the right side. What I see people do is like, oh, I'm going to do the get up. I'm going to lie down. I'm going to grab it. What happened there? What I just hit? I literally went from this position. I put my arm out. And by lifting it like almost like a semi bicep curl, I'm loading all my exter uh, external rotators and the inside of my elbow with all the stress to bring it in here. Do you really think that's going to feel good over and over and over? The way to do it, like I don't know why people don't see this as an easier option to keep your joints healthy. So you want to roll over to your right side if you're doing you know, the right arm like we've been doing this whole time. Your hand comes underneath, your left hand goes over top. From here you're going to roll over with the weight towards your chest. So much easier. And like you can literally lift a hundred pound ke kettlebell if you wanted in that position. From here, you're going to press up with both hands. And with kettlebells, um, you can move this guy into different positions on the forearm to make it feel a little bit better. Because sometimes, you know, again, bony anatomy, um, the size of the kettlebell, the, you know, the writing on the kettlebell, if it's sticking out, like it all depends. So you want to adjust it as much as possible. The other thing from here that I see is when people are not gripping the kettlebell properly, they end up doing this with their wrist. This is the worst thing you can do for your wrist. So keep it neutral and squeeze the crap out of it, right? 
Say I did my get up, I'm back down. I'm gonna bring it back to my center of the chest and then roll over to place it down. Now, in order for you to transfer it over, and I won't showcase it right now because I'll probably destroy my floor and my wife will get mad at me. You're gonna go hand over top of the kettlebell and your right hand underneath in this position and you would drag it around to the other side and now you would pick it up the same way. By doing this, you are going to save a lot on the shoulder. You're gonna save a lot when it comes to shoulder health, strength, whatever it is. So I'm pretty proud of myself that I got this done under an hour uh, because I can talk about it forever. But I'm happy that I finally got this together because the get up is one of those really, really, really uh, complex exercises that needs a lot of coaching. And on top of that, like this is just a generic tutorial. If I had someone in front of me, for sure their get up's gonna look a lot different or have different cues or have different options based on what's going on with their anatomy. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy to respond. Um, like and subscribe this video if you're watching. Um, I'm gonna be doing a lot more videos because people have been watching it, which is awesome. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Hit the show notes if you're listening. Click the video to watch it if you want to see everything I demonstrated. Um, add me on Facebook and Instagram. I post a lot of video content. And uh, you guys have a wonderful day. I miss you guys. I love you guys. Till next time.